All right. Good morning. My name is Joe Doherty. I'm the Communications Director for the Utah Department of Public Safety and the state's COVID-19 Unified Command. Uh, today is Thursday, September 3rd, 2020. Uh, we'll start today's briefing with Dr. Angela Dunn, the state epidemiologist. She'll be followed by Governor Herbert and then Governor Herbert's Education Advisor, Tammy Pfeiffer, and she will be followed by Dr. Eric Christensen, the state medical examiner. Dr. Dunn. Good morning. Our seven day rolling average today is 394 new cases per day. This is an increase from last week. We were at 366 um, average cases per day. Our rolling seven day average of percent positivity is now at 9.4% and last week we were at 8.7%. So this is a modest increase and we're not seeing anything specific in specific age groups or settings that are causing this increase. What this does mean is that right now we need to remain vigilant with the prevention measures that we know work. These measures will also help protect us from the flu as we enter flu season. However, we are fortunate to actually have a flu vaccine. So it's really important now more than ever to get vaccinated against the flu this fall. Pharmacies are already offering the flu vaccine and it's not too early to get it. Just to remind you guys that the symptoms of COVID-19 and the flu can be quite similar with fever, fatigue, cough, and other such symptoms. However, the fact that we have a flu vaccine really helps us to control the spread of flu. And COVID-19 is proving to be more deadly than the flu. We're seeing higher numbers of deaths due to COVID-19 and likely more serious long-term effects from COVID-19 than the flu for those who survive. So let's take every possible measure to protect ourselves and our community this fall so that our schools and our businesses can continue to stay open safely. So lastly, I just wanna clarify one thing. There was lots of attention last week paid to the CDC announcement that implied that asymptomatic testing is no longer needed. Here in Utah, we're really fortunate to have robust testing capacity. So we're gonna encourage asymptomatic individuals to still get tested for COVID-19. This includes close contacts to a confirmed case, exposed first responders, high-risk healthcare sittings, and then also, when we have specific outbreaks, we'll be doing asymptomatic testing as well. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we appreciate your being here, particularly again, the media. And uh, we certainly wanna thank those who've been involved in this quest for so long, for the last five and a half months. Uh, the people of Utah who've been very diligent in trying to, in fact, change behaviors and do what they can to help slow and stop the spread of this uh, coronavirus. So we thank you for your efforts in that regard. Thanks to Dr. Dunn for her uh, always insightful information and the data that she gives to us each and every week. Um, with that, let me just uh, mention, uh, you know, we're entering kind of a new chapter uh, we're going to finish up the summer. Labor Day is coming up here. That's kind of the, the holiday that signifies the end of the summer and, and as we start moving into the fall time of the year. Uh, that creates some unique challenges for us as a state going forward. Uh, not only do we start school, and that's happened already, and virtually every school district except for Salt Lake City I think is open in some form or fashion but it also means we're probably gonna be doing more things indoors as the temperature cools down and act, uh, activities we could have done outside will now have to be moved indoors. That creates a little bit more of a challenge for us as we move forward and again, trying to make sure that the infection rate uh, stays where it's at or goes down. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a few minutes as some of the Im implications of that, particularly our schools going back into session. Uh, some of you already know, it's been released in the press, uh, that we've received a request, an official request from Salt Lake City to move from the orange designation to yellow. 
and uh, Salt Lake City and Salt Lake County and their health departments have been working very closely for the last number of weeks with the state health department uh, to help work to, to bring the case counts down to allow them to qualify and to feel good about moving from orange to yellow. Let me again just reemphasize moving from orange to yellow means just less restrictions, not less risk. And uh, as we move this opportunity to yellow, uh, it gives more flexibility for the downtown businesses in particular of Salt Lake City and for overall to help keep the economy going and rebound, in fact, uh, from where it's at currently. Uh, and we'll be mindful of those who work in these establishments to keep them safe and remind everybody to keep social distancing and certainly to keep wearing a mask, which we find uh, significant evidence that wearing of the mask does help in uh, slowing the spread of the coronavirus. The phrase we ought to all use is, if I wear my mask, it helps protect you. If you wear your mask, it helps protect me. It really does stop us from having the aerosol sprays that really uh, the virus is transmitted through. And uh, we, we're finding more and more evidence of people that are asymptomatic, don't have any symptoms at all, but do have the virus and can spread it to other people inadvertently, thinking they're healthy, but their droplets get on somebody else and um, they end up getting the virus. So as we move uh, into the fall again, all of us have our part and role to play in doing the, the things that we know are common sense and it will help us slow the spread of the, of the virus. So with that, uh, as a reminder for all of us, uh, let me just say I'm pleased to be able to announce today that we're granting the request from Salt Lake City to go from uh, orange to yellow. That will be effective at 10 a.m. Friday morning tomorrow. Um, state law, in fact, requires that I notify the state legislature of any changes that we make uh, of our executive orders, and so that's in, in the process of being done now so that the legislature is made aware of this transition. Uh, at the same time that we're granting this uh, request to Salt Lake City, we're also going to grant the request from Sevier County to move from yellow to green. Uh, they've been working very diligently down there and have certainly done a good job of keeping the, the numbers down there. And they'll join 10 other counties that we already have uh, moved to green. And so they will be the 11th county to be designated green. Uh, for those who are interested in what that means and the details of it, you can go to our webpage, coronavirus.utah.gov. Uh, particularly business owners, uh, Salt Lake City, uh, again, new opportunities here, uh, some uh, new opportunities in Sevier County and the Richfield area. Uh, go to that uh, coronavirus.utah.gov and you'll get familiar with the COVID-19 business manual, which will let you know what you can do now with more in-house dining, for example, and opportunities that you have to have more customers come inside your building. And what's the protocol, in fact, to accommodate that? Um, it also, the manual explains to the business owner what you're supposed to do if, in fact, one of your employees gets sick with the COVID-19 virus and the protocol that you need to, to take place and to keep your business safe and keep your business open, which is, of course, what everybody wants to see happen. So, again, we've got some good protocols, good plans, and, uh, and uh, things that you can follow as the businesses have this opportunity to open up. By the way, we've done such a good job, I, you know, it's easy to brag and uh, we want to stay humble about this, but we're obviously doing some good things uh, correctly because our unemployment rate is the lowest in the nation, out 4.5%. Uh, our economy uh, is expected by many outside publications as they see what we've done to uh, recover quicker than any other economy in the, in the nation. Uh, that gives us hope and reason to be optimistic about the future as we move forward, certainly on the economic standpoint. And the good news is that our uh, health care on the side, uh, we have good numbers there. Our hospitalization rates are down. Uh, we're only using uh, ICU units. Uh, uh, less than 8% of the bed space is now being used by COVID-19 patients. That's about half what it used to be. Uh, we're uh, using only 2% of other beds that are not ICU beds, and, and our hospitalization rates are that we have about half of the rooms still available, 
in ICU and in just general hospital beds. So uh, the idea of trying to not overwhelm the, the healthcare system, we're doing a good job there. Now, that doesn't mean we're out of the woods yet. We still need to worry about the flu season. You've heard Dr. Dunn talk about that. Going back to school, increasing surges that can happen as we now start getting closer contact with each other and our density kind of increases as we go into the fall and winter months. So we're going to watch that very closely. Um, we're mindful that uh, COVID-19 is popping up in various areas of the state, as I've mentioned, uh, totally uh, not totally unexpected, particularly with the uh, reconvening of schools. Our young people don't seem to be as susceptible based on the data we have now as far as getting sick, uh, and, the, and the reaction is more severe to those who are older. Uh, it has kind of a graduating scale. The older you are, the more severe the reaction tends to be. Um, but we, they, uh, schools do carry the virus. Uh, younger people, even though they may not get sick, still have the virus and can transmit it to other people. That's the concern of our teachers and principals and, and the older uh, citizens that are working in our school districts and, and uh, concerned about uh, being exposed to COVID-19. So this is to be anticipated. That's the reason we've had uh, standards put in place by our health department, not only at the state level, but at the local level and our 13 regional health departments to help guide the schools as they develop their plans and uh, how they address these issues and the clusters that we've seen here uh, take place in our schools. So uh, we're working on that. We have a good plans in place and guidance. And, and so I'd like to have our education advisor, Tammy Pfeiffer, come here and show and share with us some of the efforts that have been made as well as some of the unique challenges that we're going to be facing going into the fall uh, in regards to our school system. So, Tammy? Thank you, Governor. Uh, this week, we heard about a seventh grade teacher in Davis School District who visited the homes of all of his incoming seventh grade students. He's a math teacher. And he wanted those students to get to know him personally uh, and help them make that transition to junior high. As you can imagine, Transitioning to junior high is very difficult, and we appreciate so much teachers like this teacher and other teachers that we're hearing about from all over the state doing what they can to make students feel welcome and connected to them, whether they will be teaching online or in person. Uh, since the beginning of this pandemic, we have stressed the fact that our schools need to be flexible, prepared, and nimble. Uh, we saw districts and charters work through the summer to prepare for fall opening. Uh, they prepared contingency plans. Those were posted on their district websites. They planned on a variety of scenarios, including COVID outbreaks. My own daughter is a school administrator, and I saw firsthand the enormous amount of work that went into uh, preparing for school opening over the summer. And that was happening all over the state. These first couple of weeks back to school have been filled with excitement and anticipation, but also hesitation and worry. As we heard in our briefing last week from the high school students from Enterprise, they want to be in school and are willing to do whatever it takes to be in school. Teachers are eager to teach, but they must feel safe and be protected while they are at school. And what happens in our schools is really a reflection of what's happening in the community around our schools, which is why today you've heard from Dr. Dunn and the governor, and I will reiterate that we are urging all community members to wear masks, social distance, stay home when you are sick. Children should not be sent to school when they're ill with symptoms of any kind, not just COVID symptoms. Additionally, if you or your child has symptoms, as Dr. Dunn uh, stated, please get tested. Uh, that's very, very important for us. Um, as, as the governor stated, our schools have put in mitigation strategies to do their part to provide safety for our students, our, ta our staff, and our teachers. The district and school leaders that I've spoken with have let me know how appreciative they've been of parents and students' work and their efforts uh, to cooperate with these safety protocols that are in place in our schools. They feel like they're doing their best to make schools safe places to be. Kids are masking up. They, in fact, they got used to wearing masks quite quickly, as children are known to adjust very quickly. So please support them. Please support our students by following these same precautions while you are out in the community. 
We've already seen the need for some of our schools to begin to implement their contingency plans, their remote learning plans that they, as they have experienced these uh, cases of COVID on their campuses. Pleasant Grove High School, American Preparatory Academy in Draper, and the Utah Military Academy at Camp Williams are a few of the schools that have altered their learning plan in response to the cases that have come in with students and staff. And this is appropriate, and this has been planned for in these districts and uh, charters contingency plans. All of these plans, if you're interested, should be posted on the school's websites. As the governor mentioned, the state and local health departments have put triggers in place for schools to have these conversations with their local health departments. They're working with, with the districts and the charters to support flexibility in their reaction to these, uh, to these triggers and the decisions that they make. I spoke with one educator last weekend about her feelings on the possibility of schools maybe going to remote learning a couple of weeks or maybe even a couple of months after school uh, began. And she said that as an educational leader and as a parent, she was a little hesitant to have school start in the fall. Uh, she felt it might be safer to go online. But she said she quickly changed her mind when she entered the school building on the first day of school. She said seeing the students, hearing their laughter and their voices and their excitement about being back in school made her realize the value of being in person for both the students and the educators, even if it was for just a short amount of time. So despite some schools moving now to remote learning, we agree that there's a value in having students have that opportunity to begin to build a relationship with their teacher or teachers in person. Remote learning can be more successful when those students have built that foundation of knowing who their teacher is and establishing, beginning to establish that relationship. We understand that the flexibility that we're asking for puts a huge burden on families, on teachers, on district administrators, but we believe in the benefits of in-person learning. And we believe that they're so important for our students that we need to continue to try. We also believe that as a community, we can do our part to keep our schools safe and healthy. So we again ask and urge everyone to please do your part to help us provide these safe learning environments for our students. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, we appreciate the work of so many people. This is not, as you can imagine, the logistical challenge that we have here with 41 school districts, 670,000 students, uh, and the different uh, demographics we have throughout the state with our many, many schools is a real challenge. But the kids do want to be back in school. Uh, they're anxious to be back in school. They've, uh, they miss the learning experience and the association with their fellow students and friends uh, there. And the teachers are just as excited to have the, have the students back. They, they live to teach. They're doing it because that's something that they believe in and they enjoy. And, and of course, having the students in their classroom uh, brings them the ultimate joy of teaching. Uh, I appreciated the fact that students want to be there and they're willing to do what's necessary to keep the schools open. We had last week uh, some student body officers that came and spoke to us uh, with, uh, with a virtual uh, approach here that they spoke to us from down in the Washington County area and talked about their willingness to sacrifice and it was not asking too much for them to wear a mask in order to keep their schools open and keep them safe and particularly not only the schools, but also the opportunity to have extracurricular activities. So they get it. They, they are wise beyond their years and understand what sometimes we as adults don't appreciate maybe as much as they do, and uh, we all have our role to play. Last reminder, too, is that if you feel sick, if you have symptoms, or if you've been exposed to somebody that has COVID-19, then you should go in and get tested. And those symptoms are, you know, fever, if you have a sore throat, loss of smell, loss of taste, muscle aches or stiffness or shortness of breath, if you have one of those six symptoms, then go get tested. And it doesn't cost anything. For most people, it's, it's no cost. And uh, it's easy to do. And, and, and I'm going to talk about some rapid testing here in a minute. But uh, again, we, we still need to have people go get tested. And we encourage you to do that. This is designed to help keep everybody safe and you safe. And, uh, I'll just make a last plea that there's a lot of uncertainty around the COVID-19. 
Uh, what we thought, you know, five and a half months ago and what we learned today and know today are different. Uh, this has been a work in progress. We have, have evolved over what we understand based on science and medicine. It's, uh, it's modified, it's been changed, and, and so it's been hard to kind of keep up. But we're doing the best we can with the best advice that we have from our science and medical advisors. But COVID-19 is a serious uh, illness. It's a serious respiratory, respiratory disease and uh, attacks the lungs. Uh, most people will survive, but we don't know what the long-term effects are going to be. Uh, we do know people that still have fatigue two months later. We know people still have not gained their uh, back their sense of smell or their sense of taste and, you know, two to three months later. Uh, we don't know what the long-term effects will be on lungs and heart. Uh, so again, better safe than sorry, I say. So let's take extra precautions until we know mo uh, more about this COVID-19. Um, let me uh, transition to this. Uh, I, I know that the, we had the CDC data was released here last week, and some have looked at the data and, and thought, oh, gee, uh, this means something other than what it means. Some of uh, those of, out there that mistrust government, and I understand that, um, you know, cynicism that we get there. Are concerned that maybe somebody's gaming the system and and, and jimmying the numbers, and uh, particularly as it relates to deaths, uh, how they've identified the the death rates. Uh, without a doubt, COVID-19 right now in Utah is over 400, uh, maybe 410 deaths, what the number was today, uh, and more than 177,000 people have died in the United States. Uh, we do understand. As you've heard Dr. Dunn explain, it is more deadly than the traditional flu. Uh, estimates three to seven times more deadly. Um, you know, we, is, that's lower than what was originally predicted, you know, five and a half months ago. So there's good news there, but it's still, uh, I think, more serious than traditional flu. So today I've invited our state medical examiner, Dr. Eric Christensen, to talk about how deaths are certified in Utah. We have this rumor out there that somehow people are dying, uh, but we label it COVID-19 when it's something else that they're dying from, and so we're mislabeling them for whatever reason, uh, like there's a conspiracy going on. So I've asked Dr. Christian to come and talk about how deaths are certified here in the state of Utah. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm grateful for the opportunity today to uh, discuss death certification relating to COVID-19 deaths in the state. Uh, the Office of the Medical Examiner, which is part of the Utah Department of Health's Division of Disease Control and Prevention, uh, is responsible by statute to investigate specific categories of deaths. Among these, uh, we are specifically tasked to investigate deaths that appear to be the result of a th uh, disease that may constitute a threat to the public health. Um, like all deaths that fall under the jurisdiction of the Office of the Medical Examiner, we receive reports about these deaths from a variety of sources, uh, including attending physicians, hospital staff, uh, law enforcement. Uh, during the current pandemic, uh, as we are also investigating these uh, COVID deaths, we're also working closely with the epidemiology staff of the Department of Health, uh, as well as the Office of Vital Records and Statistics to ensure that all deaths uh, related to COVID-19 are reported to us. Uh, the Office of the Medical Examiner is involved every day and was doing this long before COVID in making determinations of cause of death uh, in deaths that occur under a variety of circumstances. Uh, part of that work involves determination of whether conditions that are identified either by history, uh, by examination, uh, or uh, by lab testing are related to the underlying cause of death. For example, did this drug that was found in this person's toxicology results uh, contribute, or can contribute to or cause their death? Uh, is this significant heart disease, which we see on our autopsy examination, related to their cause of death, or is it is it something uh, unrelated? And much of this kind of work that we do all the time um, involves sorting out a variety of potential causes of death to identify the cause of death in a given individual's case. Uh, there's been much discussion about what constitutes a death from COVID-19, and with so many individuals 
uh, having advanced age as well as a lot of comorbid conditions, how can we be sure that these people are not just dead from these other illnesses and uh, processes that were already going on uh, in their bodies? Um, COVID-19, the infection that results from infection with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, has been described as causing death by a variety of mechanisms, uh, which range from uh, respiratory uh, uh, failure, acute lung injury, uh, sepsis, aberrant inflammatory responses, blood clots, and, and a variety of others. Um, and it, clearly there have been a number of conditions that have been identified as uh, potential risk factors for severe illness and death, uh, including uh, uh, diabetes, hypertension, uh, and obesity, among others. In Utah, um, COVID-19 deaths are reported to the investigation staff of our office um, uh, through means, as I mentioned previously. Our investigators then take a history uh, of events from the reporting party, including a review of the circumstances and events that led up to the decedent's uh, death, a review of their medical history and issues, uh, a listing of any positive test results they've had and when those were, and information about exposures uh, to other individuals with COVID. Following this initial report, the OME requests medical records from hospitals, long-term care facilities, uh, and hospice organizations and law enforcement where relevant. In some cases, we do additional follow-up with uh, family members and or certifying physicians uh, to ascertain, uh, you know, gain, gain some clarity on the specifics of what happened in the final days and hours of an individual patient. Uh, most of the deaths that are reported to the OME um, are then reported by us to the Department of Health uh, and are then reported publicly uh, uh, by the uh, Unified Command. Um, the, if the information that we have initially, uh, based on history, uh, uh, clinical information, and, and what's on a death certificate is consistent, we will report those deaths. Some require further investigation before we report those uh, on. Um, rarely, uh, the information that we receive up front uh, turns out not to be the case, and that's true of uh, medical examiner cases uh, aside from COVID as well, that the initial story you get doesn't always uh, turn out to be what you thought it was. Additional questioning uh, raises additional answers that sometimes change the situation. Um, but so, and, and it, in those cases where we determine that uh, what was originally reported as a COVID death is not in fact a COVID death, um, we change that death certificate um, uh, to remove COVID-19 as a cause. That has happened thus far in about 1% uh, of all the deaths that have been reported to us. Deaths that result from trauma, um, drug intoxication, or other, other obvious uh, non-COVID related causes are not reported as COVID deaths, but are reported as uh, positive tests if the individual tests positive. So all deaths in Utah reported to date have been based on positive test results as well as history and symptoms that are consistent with COVID. Uh, the robust system of checks that we have in place to identify the deaths, the investigative and review process that we have uh, to ensure that what is reported is consistent uh, with that certification, as well as then the normal processes of the OME to ensure that uh, deaths from COVID-19 that occur outside the medical care system uh, are also found and identified. So uh, in summary, um, all, all of the uh, deaths that we see in this state are thoroughly uh, adjudicated, if you will, reviewed uh, in depth uh, to uh, the degree necessary to uh, make an ascertainment as to whether COVID is in fact part of, uh, appropriately part of the cause of death. And thus far we uh, have, had, as I said, had to change very few uh, and are uh, um, confident in the numbers that are being reported. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Christensen. We appreciate your work. Um, it's not an easy assignment, uh, but we appreciate the work of you and your team in being so diligent at this uh, critical time uh, to help us identify really what's taking place. Data informs us as far as how we develop policy and the success uh, or failure of what we're doing uh, uh, with our policies. So we appreciate the work of, of your team. Um, for those out there listening, again, if you want to go to our coronavirus.utah.gov, uh, you'll have the latest updates on this issue. And uh, again, we've worked very hard uh, in Utah taking great care to make sure that the data we give you is accurate. Uh, you can trust the data that we give you uh, as to being a, a tr a truthful and accurate, as least as far as can be ascertained. And so, again, we thank those who are providing that for our use. Um, one final note, uh, I was on a, a conference call uh, this past Tuesday with the Vice President 
and uh, they announced then that they're going to put more money into rapid antigen testing. Now, we've talked about testing, it seems like every week it's been a critical issue for us to have people to have the ability to get tested so we know who has the virus and what we can do to help them uh, get through that and help them not spread it to other people. Testing is a way for us to, uh, to find out who's got it and then to contact and trace so we can protect others from it. Um, the Department of Health and Human Services, HHS, is now going to ship 150 million of these new antigen tests. Uh, they're new, they're easier. Uh, you take a swab, you put it on a piece of paper, and they're quicker. You can have the results in 15 minutes. So an opportunity for us, in fact, to enhance our testing capability with minimal inconvenience and rapid results to help us again know who's got it and then to isolate and uh, slow down and stop the spread of the coronavirus. HHS has identified priority groups. We'll get this first. Uh, first responders will be on that list. Uh, those in public education K through 12 will be identified. Daycares, uh, long-term care centers for our senior citizens are on the list, as well as personnel that are involved with critical infrastructure like sewer and water issues that are necessary to maintain and keep our society functioning. So there's some priority groups, but that's going to be arriving immediately, and that's going to help us again with this new antigen swab test on a card results in about 15 minutes. Uh, let me just uh, sum up here and say, again, this really has been a unique time in our history, as we all know. Yeah, it's really, in not anybody's lifetime have we seen anything like this. It permeates every part of society. Uh, there are sacrifices that we're having to go through and to give to for the good of the whole, the good of the community. The, I know it's not necessarily easy, but it's necessary. And uh, we appreciate everybody doing their part. Um, by the way, what we're doing and how we create policy is not done in a vacuum. Uh, we have a unified command. We have nearly 200 people involved in that, from the private sector, from healthcare, from scientists, data collection, um, the business community and the private sector, all working together to find a balanced approach of how we can, in fact, protect everybody's health and those that get sick to get better. And uh, also at the same time to make sure we protect our economy so that people have a job and opportunity. We know that's a significant, serious issue too that causes other health problems, whether it be mental health or depression. Uh, you know, there's other associated ills that come from not having a healthy economy. So on balance, we've done a pretty good job. I feel good about where we're at, but we still have room to improve and certainly a, a longer road to hoe uh, before we're out of this uh, challenge. We do hear about a vaccine that's going to be on the market coming up, hopefully by the end of the year. Um, that was something we're going to be prepared for, we'll work for, we'll work with the administration to make sure that we're ready when the vaccine is ready. Um, and whether that's by the end of this year, or, uh, a lot of people in, think by the end of the first quarter of 2021, again, that's something we'll look forward to, to making sure we're prepared. Uh, last but not least, um, uh, again, we've asked everybody to kind of use a little common sense, uh, which goes a long way towards helping us resolve this challenge. We have Labor Day coming up this weekend. The last opportunity to go out there and and have fun in the sun and socialize with others. And we just want you to be careful. Uh, don't be foolish in what you do out there as you associate. We don't have a spike in infections as we come back, you know, a week or two weeks later after the, the holiday season. So uh, be wise, uh, follow the protocols, which we know work, uh, wearing of the mask, social distancing, proper hygiene, uh, those kinds of things will go a long ways towards making sure we continue to control the case numbers here in the state of Utah and the infection rate to continue to go down. So again, uh, with the mask, I'll just reiterate my phrase. Me wearing the mask protects you. You wearing the mask protects me. And together, we can, in fact, get on top of this. So with that, we'll open it up for questions. Hi, Governor. It's Ben Winslow with Fox 13. I wanted to ask if there were any plans for additional protections for schools as we're starting to see cases rise. And there was a recent report that put us last in terms of uh, offering protections for teachers as they work during COVID-19. Let me ask Tammy to come in and talk about that. As you all know, when we started this uh, 
quest to, to open up schools. We had standards created by the health department, uh, social distancing. We have the mandate of mask wearing in K through 12, with some exceptions for those who may have a disability or some need to not wear a mask. Um, and recognizing this is not a surprise, anticipating as we had closer quarters and people getting together, uh, that there may be this ability to share the virus. It, it doesn't originate at schools. People are bringing it to school and then sharing it with others when they get there. And so we have these plans in place to help us open up, and we have subsequent plan B, in fact, if we have a too many people that get the COVID-19. So I want, uh, Tammy, if you'll come in and just talk about as we shift to Plan B, how is that process going to work? Uh, so, Ben, thanks for that question. I, I read that same article, I think, that you're referring to um, that puts Utah last for protecting teachers from the virus, and I thought the criteria were quite interesting. Uh, this was an article from an online insurance company, and some of the things that they looked at were the age of our teachers, the strength of our teachers' union, um, they looked at our teacher pay, our school funding, um, health care quality and accessibility. And we were noted that Utah was above average in health care equality and accessibility um, and that we have a strong teacher union, although I'm not, I, I'm not sure the connection between that and being able to put in health protections for our teachers. So I, I'm not sure how they weighted each factor. Uh, to come up with that designation, but I, I can just say that we have emphasized over and over how important it is that we protect our teachers, that we cannot have quality schools without educators that are safe and feel safe and protected. Um, the, the report did raise a, a concern about class sizes, and this is something that we've known for a long time with our young population that we have large class sizes, and some of the things that districts are doing to address that is exactly what you're seeing uh, in, in Alpine as they move to a hybrid schedule. And other districts that are having uh, A-B days and having half the student population come on one day and half the population come on the other day. And so, so that is one of those mitigation efforts that as we see cases rise at schools, they see that trigger and they will have less students in the classroom, more students doing online learning. One concern that we have that we need to continually address is the accessibility to broadband services for all of our students. As we move to online, we have to keep that top of mind, that we need to make sure that these students have access to broadband and the, uh, the computers, the laptops, and the Chromebooks to do that. But this will be addressed on a district by district or charter by charter basis as they watch these numbers uh, go up. And as they go down, they will go back to the previous method of instruction, which is typically uh, the in-class instruction. But is there any plans for additional protections, more PPEs, or additional measures being taken as we see these cases climb? Uh, I'm not sure, Ben, what other additional measures that you might be referring to. Uh, we have PPE that has gone out to all of the districts. Uh, the districts are responsible. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to explain this. Districts are responsible for PPE. They all received CARES Act funding. And they are using a lot of that CARES Act funding in districts and charter for PPE. So they are responsible for that. In addition to that, our office sent PPE, some PPE out to districts, and then the State Board of Education also tried to pitch in where they could. Uh, we are trying to provide more opportunities for them to take advantage of PPE resources that are at the county level. And I've sent that information to superintendents uh, and charter directors as well, because we feel like there are some funds there that they could take advantage of to provide more PPE. Let me just add, Ben, too, that uh, there is only so much PPE that you can wear. And so if everybody has a mask, again, we've given to the teachers, they have masks and shields to wear. So we're trying to accommodate that. Where we have made some changes, I think you'll see some modifications as we have infection rates, if they increase, will be in how we, in fact, socially distance, uh, having classes cut in half so there's more room for social distancing, having half of the student body go one day and, uh, and, and the other half the other day uh, uh, so that we can really, in essence, cut the classroom sizes in half. Uh, 
uh, maybe half a day and a uh, morning and an afternoon. So there's different ways to, to skin the cat when it comes to that. But I think you're going to see work on social distancing as a way that we can modify and help. Uh, certainly our goal is to make sure that our students are safe and our teachers are safe and those involved in our schools. And we want that to be a safe place for people to go. Next question. Hi, Governor. This is Sophia Epolito with the Associated Press. Um, I was wondering, the CDC and the Trump administration sent out uh, a letter recently uh, calling for states to be prepared to open COVID-19 vaccine distribution centers by November 1st. I was wondering if Utah is planning to expedite um, its licensing and permitting processes, as the CDC is asking. That just came out, as you know, and our folks will, in fact, do what we can to be prepared. We hope that that's not just overly optimism uh, regarding a vaccine being ready to distribute. We know it's really been an all hands on deck, and I've met personally with Steve Hahn, who's the head of the FDC, or excuse me, the FDA, um, and uh, talked about the vaccine. Uh, he's indicated that the process they've done uh, is going to streamline it. Uh, so what would normally take, you know, two or three years, they're going to be doing it in, in one year. Uh, and he emphasized, too, that we're not doing anything that's going to, in fact, make it unsafe or that we're cutting corners as far as the protocol is necessary and the clinical study is necessary. But they are doing it in a very rapid way. I, I, what they're wanting to make sure is states are ready. Once the vaccine is available, that we can then distribute it to those uh, in need, and Utah will be prepared for that eventuality. And just a quick follow-up. Um, do you think that this ramping up of the process uh, it might suggest that it's being politicized, considering that November 1st is just a couple days before the 2020 election? Do you have any concerns about that? I, I certainly am not surprised at the criticism. Uh, I mean, politics, unfortunately, has entered into this issue in ways that uh, probably uh, is disappointing to all of us. It just happens to be the time of year. So no matter what happens, you know, good, bad, or indifferent, somebody's there to criticize, and sometimes for political purposes. So uh, again, I can't answer, you know, what's happening with the FDA and, and this effort. Um, it, it's, uh, I'm sure we're try we want to get it done as quick as we can, uh, whether that's fortuitous for the elections in November for the current administration, I guess that's anybody's opinion. Next question. Hi, this is Wendy Leonard from Deseret News. Uh, we've seen these three schools move into their contingency plans. Um, are you aware of others that are close to needing to do that? And how will that be reported? It seems like some of the districts are not as forthcoming to the public, like not telling them exactly which schools are impacted. Well, let me, I'll take the last and we'll have Dr. Dunn come and speak uh, on this issue. but. Uh, Part of being a good citizen is being responsible to, in fact, uh, help society. And if you're sick, you know, you ought to get tested, uh, make sure that we can control the spread of the coronavirus so that it doesn't become a, a bigger problem for the community and society. So uh, I would hope that everybody, you know, if you're sick, stay home. If you have the symptoms of the coronavirus, you ought to go get tested. Let us help you uh, get through that process and let us help you not spread it to other people who would become innocent victims of that coronavirus. So it really did, it requires all of us to be good citizens and work together to make sure we do our part, and that includes if you have symptoms, get tested. So the decision um, on whether or not a school needs to go virtual or take other actions to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in their school setting is really a discussion between the school their school board and the local health department. So they're working to make sure that they have flexible plans in place that allow for the protection of students and teachers and staff. In terms of reporting, um, we have built a school surveillance system. It's a brand new system um, where we are able to get um, data on all positive COVID cases um, that have been in the school setting during their infectious period or the time when they were exposed. Given that this is a new surveillance system, we are doing a lot of data quality on it to make sure that the data is accurate and timely before releasing any um, data to the public. We do have a group working together, both with um, our school stakeholders and our local public health stakeholders, to determine what level of data would be most useful to the public to release, to release publicly. 
Um, so we do expect that data to be released in the coming weeks, but we really want to make sure that data is quality before, before we release it. Next question. Uh, hey, no, I've got a question for the governor. Uh, this is Jed Bowell from KSL TV. Good morning, Governor. Good morning, Jed. Uh, uh, this may also be for Dr. Dunn. I'm interested in the, the CDC request for all of the states to be ready for a mass vaccine campaign uh, that they announced yesterday. And I'm curious as to uh, what are the key steps in rolling out that kind of campaign? And has the state already been uh, working ahead on some of those critical steps? Well, thank you, Jess. As we just mentioned, uh, we are trying to get prepared. It just was announced. We've all been looking. I've talked with the president and the vice president on numerous occasions about what can we do to develop a vaccine. That's where we can really get back to a more normal association with each other. Uh, they've talked in terms of therapeutics that can help us treat the symptoms of the but not inoculate us against catching the virus. So a lot of efforts in many areas out there trying to find the solution uh, with medicine. And we're doing our part. So I'm going to let Dr. Dunn talk about what the process is. Thank you. So we have been working on vaccine distribution for several months now. Um, you know, when this pandemic was apparent that it was spreading throughout Utah, putting even before a vaccine was even on our radar for being available this fall, that was already on our um, planning list to figure out when we do get a vaccine, how do we distribute it effectively. We're taking a lot of lessons learned from H1N1 and so is the federal government. So the distribution chain will likely be a mix of public health, healthcare systems and pharmacies working together to make sure that the most amount of people have access to the vaccine when it does become available. So it's something that we've been working on for a while with stakeholders throughout the state um, to ensure accessibility. Are you confident that that's something that our state can, can execute when it comes down the pike? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Yes, this is uh, Jacob Poffenstein from CSL.com. Um, Governor, you mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, Utah is still seeing a, a fairly promising uh, unemployment rate. Um, but I wanted to ask about consumer confidence, um, which is, you know, part of part of businesses reopening, obviously. Um, are, what, what are you seeing overall as far as consumer confidence here in Utah? Are people willing to, you know, go back and, and patronize those businesses or are people still fairly hesitant to go back? You know, surprisingly, some... Uh businesses are thriving. Uh, some businesses are growing. Kentucky has a number of businesses involved in paper goods where more people are staying home and eating home and uh, maybe staying in their backyard as opposed to going out to other locations. And one of the reasons Kentucky's had a lower uh, unemployment rate is because some of the businesses located in Kentucky have uh, actually improved during the, the pandemic. Uh, that's certainly not the norm, but uh, Consumer confidence, you know, is uh, b good in some areas and, and maybe a little less in others. Uh, we still find that people are not traveling as much. Uh, certainly, uh, I just traveled to Washington, D.C., and the plane was, you know, uh, half full. Uh, and yet the, the planes are as clean as I've ever seen them. And they are taking uh, protocols, the mask wearing and separation between the seats, uh, I can tell having done it now, I feel very comfortable and I have confidence in, in flying by commercial airline. Um, the hospitality industry, whether you're going to travel to some locations, uh, you might be a little bit reluctant where they have a high spike in infection rates. Uh, In-house dining still has not come back uh, like it has in the past. And we see the private sector recognizing we've got to create. It has nothing to do with government uh, fiat. It has to do with consumer confidence that you mentioned, wanting to come back and eat in my restaurant. What am I doing as a restaurateur to, in fact, ensure confidence of the, of the consumer so that they feel like if I go there, I'm, I'm not going to get sick. I'm going to be okay and I can have a good meal and, and enjoy uh, others' company in a socially acceptable way with social distancing and protocols in place. So the private sector stepped up dramatically. We appreciate the work of the Chambers of Commerce throughout the state where they're having people take the pledge, meaning businesses, 
uh, do what you can to stay open and stay safe. That's again part of bringing about uh, consumer confidence. So it's going to take some time for, to build it back to where it was. The vaccine is certainly going to help maybe close the last, uh, you know, a few yards to get to the goal line. But we're building on that right now. Consumer, consumer confidence is increasing. I, I see where our, our mass transit, people are not traveling as much on our tracks and our, and our front runner. And, um, but, the, the, but the numbers are going up from what they were just, uh, you know, a month ago. So I think we're trending in the right direction. And hopefully by the end of this year, we'll be back to uh, kind of everybody feeling really good about the society and the community and, and more association together. Next question. Uh, uh, good morning, Governor uh, and Dr. Dunn. Um, this is actually a question for Dr. Dunn and for, and for Dr. Christensen. Uh, two part thing. Dr. Dunn, you said people who are asymptomatic should get tested. Is that a change from what Utahns have been told before now that they should uh, show at least one symptom? No, so we have been pushing asymptomatic testing for those who need it. Um, and they include close contacts to a confirmed case, um, exposed first responders, and certain high-risk healthcare settings and when we're investigating outbreaks. So our um, strategy for asymptomatic testing has not changed. Okay. And then also to Dr. Dunn and to Dr. Christensen, uh, both of you were answering back to news that had been coming out of the CDC, both about uh, who should get tested and how deaths are recorded. And then as we heard before, uh, there's skepticism about the CDC saying that a vaccine might be available just before election day. Taking all of that, Together, are you as medical experts concerned in any way about the credibility of the CDC right now? So um, I can speak from the asymptomatic standpoint. Um, that was a recommendation out of the White House Task Force for Coronavirus with input from the CDC. Um, and so again, just like a state response, it's not one single agency leading all of the strategy. Um, it's a coordinated response among a lot of agencies. Um, so I still have a lot of faith in the CDC moving forward with the amount of expertise they have on staff. I would say the same thing for the, the death data. I mean, the, their weekly mortality report that was put out, you know, last week with the additional information regarding uh, um, comorbidities and the 6% number that has caused a lot of furor, um, that, that is not really uh, uh, terribly surprising. Death certification is certainly not an exact science. And uh, the fact that uh, one, a death certificate says only COVID-19 on it does not mean they didn't have uh, comorbidities and the flip side of that is um, just because they did doesn't mean they have to be put on. So um, I, 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 there's nothing really surprising about that data for us. Okay, we'll have one last question. Hi, Governor Herbert. This is Sonia Hudson from KUER. Um, I'm curious um, your thoughts on teachers resigning or leaving um, once they get into the school year because of fears about COVID-19, um, particularly with that report that came out today um, that put Utah at the top or bottom of the list, depending on how you look at it in terms of teacher safety. Um, is that something that you're concerned about, more teachers leaving, especially given the teacher shortage in the state? I'm concerned about making sure that schools are as safe as they can possibly be during a pandemic. Uh, and we should have parents and expect this, that when they send their kids to school, they go to a safe environment. And that was uh, what they expected before a pandemic. Now we have this compounding problem that's unique in our history. Uh, uh, it certainly is confusing, it's uncertain, uh, it's complex. But we wanna make sure that our schools are a safe environment for our students to go and be taught. Secondly, we wanna make sure that the, it's a safe environment for our teachers to go teach. And certainly there's been some concerns raised by the teachers saying, look, I'm more susceptible to a severe reaction to COVID-19 than the students that I teach. And that's just the nature of, of what we have with this, with this coronavirus. Uh, we wanna make sure that they feel safe too. And hence the masks for the children is as much to protect the teachers as it is to protect the students. In fact, probably more so. Uh, I think our teachers do feel like we're doing everything we, that can be done to create a safe environment. Uh, again, that will uh, be a continual effort. This is not a once, it's done and uh, we start and it's done forever. We will learn as we go, as we uh, have done uh, the last five months. 
uh, but we we'll want to make sure that this is an environment. We'll listen to the teachers. They might have some suggestions of what we can do better. Work with the local school district's plan, work with the principal and their, and their uh, local school. Uh, so I think we'll have some improvements. I'm, I am concerned about having a safe environment, and if we have that, I don't have to worry about teachers leaving. First of all, let me say we're always concerned when a teacher leaves a profession. We love them. We know that they love teaching. Those of you that know teachers know that it's in our blood. And so to see them leave the classroom for any reason it is always a little bit troubling, but they're doing what they feel they need to do for themselves and their families. We have tried to address this early on. We met with uh, leaders from the Utah Education Association almost two months ago, I believe, Governor, to hear those concerns, to respond to those concerns. As the governor stated, that's why we implemented the mask mandate across the state so that teachers could feel like we were doing all that we could to protect them. You will see some of these teachers leaving um, more in certain districts than others. And those decisions are based on what's happening in their district. Some districts have been able to accommodate every teacher who is asked to teach remotely. As they've had students go online and the parents choose to have students go online, they've assigned high-risk teachers to teach those students remotely. And they've been able to accommodate those teachers' concerns. To what level that's happening district by district is something that's up to those district school boards to decide and to make those decisions. And we've encouraged them, we've reached out to superintendents, we've asked them how they've engaged their teachers association, uh, and then we've also had those conversations with the teachers association. But we're doing everything we can. And as teachers, we encouraged, I think about a month ago during this press conference, we've encouraged teachers and parents to approach their local school board and their local superintendent if they have these concerns and if they have lingering concerns. And though, that's the level that those concerns would be addressed is at the local level. With that, we thank you again for uh, being a part of our uh, press availability uh, today. We appreciate the good work of so many that's made this possible. Uh, again, as we go into the fall and again, as our circumstances will change as we start gathering more indoors than outdoors, uh, again, we, we need to make sure that we're prudent, that we, in fact, are diligent in doing what we know is going to help the most effective and efficient way, social distancing, and where the masks become more important now as we go into the fall time of the year than ever before. And it's uh, certainly a sacrifice, but it's not too much to ask of all of us to do our part. And, and that will help our community get safe and, and survive as best we can through this pandemic. So thank you very much for your good work. Uh, be good, stay safe. Thank you. Uh, one, one little note that the, uh, the website for businesses to sign up to take the pledge is stayopenutah.com. And so we appreciate all the businesses that are participating in that. This concludes the press conference for today, Thursday, September 3rd, 2020. Thank you, and we will talk to you next week.